Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata is a really strange and revolutionary piece. And I think a lot of people don't really realize just how strange it is, harmonically, melodically. In so many aspects, this is Beethoven at his most revolutionary. And that's what I want to talk to you about in this piece today. We're going to go through it, take a look at the harmonies, take a look at some of the chord progressions and fascinating things that Beethoven's doing in this piece, um, which will help you to play it better. And also, if you're interested in composing music, some of these tricks might be relevant to you as well. My name is Jason Paul Peterson. Welcome to my YouTube channel, and I hope you enjoy this video on Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. So the first thing to notice about the Moonlight Sonata is that Beethoven gives us this very strange indication at the beginning of the piece. It's a long sentence in Italian, which I'm not going to try and pronounce, but it basically says, keep the pedal held down for the entire piece. Now, if you do that, of course, on a modern piano, the harmonies get really blurry. Everything blurs together um, like this. And that would have been a very unusual effect at the time. And on a modern piano, it's actually a bit too much because the modern instruments have so much resonance and so we generally tend to change the pedal during this piece. But if you think about what Beethoven actually wanted, he writes that the pedal should be kept held down the entire time, which would have created this really blurry kind of sound. And uh, a little bit of that we can also capture in our own playing by uh, changing the pedal slower, allowing for more time for the chords to melt one into the next and so forth. Let's talk just a little bit about the character and the general nature of this piece and what makes it so unusual. So if you think of a sonata in the classical period, a, a sonata generally has some sort of nice theme, something like... Or another example from Mozart, something like... Something that can be sung very easily. A nice singable melody. But what we get in this sonata, in the Moonlight Sonata, which is very strange, is this sort of thing at the beginning, which isn't really a melody. Um, I mean, you can sing it, but it's incredibly boring, right? If you just sing da 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 Quite unusual. I mean, he's not giving us any real good melody. And so we start the sonata and we're sort of unsure. What, what's going on here? Is this, um, is this the main melody of the piece? Because if it is, it's, a, it's not a very good one. It's a very repetitive one. It doesn't change a lot. Um, it's more like um, a sort of a, a broken chord accompaniment. So that makes us think, well, maybe there's a melody still on the way. And indeed, a little bit later, one comes in, we get this melody. But even this one is not really... Uh, a compelling, fascinating melody. I mean, we get, what do we get? We get uh, the same note repeated six times in a row. So this is also very strange for a sonata. Uh, it's a piece which is so memorable and yet doesn't really have that sort of compelling melodic element that um, most sonatas would have at the beginning. Um, so, so let's talk a bit about the harmonies. The harmonies here are really, really interesting. Um, this piece is in C sharp minor, of course, also an unusual choice uh, for a classical piece with four sharps. And we start out, as I mentioned, with this sort of arpeggiated C minor chord. Then the bass drops down. What does that give us? It turns this C sharp minor chord into a C sharp minor seventh chord with the seventh of the chord here in the bass, an unusual place for the seventh. But it leads us so well to this next chord, this A major chord and going from there to a D major chord, and then turning right around with four chords right after one, and next, one, one another, and going back to the C sharp minor chord again. So this is like, it's like this key of sort of, almost like a sense of hopelessness, which um, in the middle gives us just a little glimmer of sunlight when we get to the A major chord here. Suddenly we're in a major key and another major chord, okay? So we have a little sense of rising out of this kind of sense of hopelessness, uh, but then Beethoven says, no, we're going right back to C sharp minor again. And there we go. By the way, after this A major chord, we get this D major chord. 
if you listen to that, it's a very unusual chord. It's a regular major chord, but in this context, of course, we would normally have a D sharp in the chord. In the key signature, we have four sharps, including D sharp. If we listen to it with the D sharp, that's also a perfectly valid chord, would have been a more normal choice. But to turn this into a D natural and a D major chord, is a very special color. In fact, it's so sp special that this chord has um, its own name in music theory terminology. It's called the Neapolitan chord. The Neapolitan chord is a chord built on the flat second scale degree. So we have a piece in C sharp minor here. C sharp minor is our root, our uh, home base for this key. Uh, this is our tonic, we would say, and the D major chord is just one half step, step uh, above that C sharp. So we have the C sharp minor chord and the D major chord only one half step above that. Um, a very strange movement, actually, because most of our movement in, in music is by fourths or fifths or, or thirds, but to go up uh, just uh, a minor second to a D major chord. It's a very special color. This chord, by the way, the Neapolitan chord, generally occurs with the third of the chord in the bass. So this F sharp in the bass, the third of the D major chord, this F sharp is in the bass. And uh, let's listen to it one more time. I'll play it a little faster. C sharp minor, changing to a seventh chord, which leads us to the first major chord, A major, and then the D major, the Neapolitan chord, G7, C sharp minor, a sus4 chord, G sharp sus4, going to the dominant seventh chord of G sharp, and then going back to C sharp minor, and so on. Now before we get any further, I just want to mention if you're interested in learning this piece, learning more about the Moonlight Sonata and playing it yourself, check out my online piano course, petersonpianoacademy.com. petersonpianoacademy.com. It's a comprehensive piano course that will uh, take you from your very first steps as a beginner all the way through advanced techniques and pieces, exercises, repertoire, uh, harmonic exercises, and much more. Now let's continue on looking at a few more of these harmonies. So we're continuing on and now comes this melody with the G sharp on the top, which is hardly a melody, it's just this repeated note, right? Uh, and we're still in the world of C sharp minor here, but we get a beautiful modulation to the key of E major. Watch this. We go to the subdominant, and now we go to E major in the second inversion with the fifth in the bass. This pulls really strongly dominant and then to the tonic. Now I want to take a moment here just to talk about something which really is extremely important when you're playing this piece, piece which is you know people often say well why do I need to study music theory? Why, why do I need to know about these chords? Uh, the whole point of knowing about these chords is that the tension in the music the tension and the release, which is so crucial to basically any kind of Western music, uh, comes from the relationships of these chords to one another. So to take this example, uh, we're in the world of C minor, and when we go to the subdominant, that's a chord with more tension in it, right? So we would make a, so a little bit of a crescendo going into that chord, and then this one, this is a very instable chord, this E major, uh, because it's in the second inversion. If you know about second inversion chords, you know they're very unstable. And then they, that chord leads us so well back to E major. We're not back to E major, this is actually the first time we're in E major, right? This is a modulation to E major. So this is pretty cool. We start off in C sharp minor, and with a little bit of harmonic weaving, we suddenly end up in this world of E major. Um, now E major, you listen to it, sounds like such a peaceful key, right? It's such a beautiful, um, sort of heavenly kind of world, and Beethoven instantly changes that by taking this G sharp down to the G. And what does that do? It changes our E major chord into an E minor chord, right? So here's our E minor chord. And then he gives us the, a G7 chord, also in an inversion with the fifth of the chord in the bass. Again, um, a second inversion chord. And that leads very well to a C major chord, but we don't stay there very long. We continue on, and we're now in B minor. And a little 
cadence in B minor with the 6-4 chord again, going to our 5 F sharp dominant of B minor. So our dominant chord, F sharp major, leading to B minor. And now he does the opposite thing. He changes the minor chord into a major chord, B major. So we're going from minor up to major, right? Interesting. And now we get one of these moments of genius here. Look at, listen to this harmony right here. This interval is so uh, painful. It's so uh, dissonant. It is really something that I think is just it's one of those strokes of genius. If he hadn't put that in this piece, uh, it wouldn't be half as great a piece as it is. But he moves up to this C, which creates a minor ninth between uh, this B and this C here. It's extremely dissonant, like an octave and one more half step on top of it. You can think of it that way. And so that distance has to resolve but he sort of overshoots and goes to the A sharp, which then has to resolve up to the B, right? Listen to it once again. So we get the dissonance on the top, the C, resolving to the, sort of to the A sharp, but that's also still dissonant. It has to pull up to the B, right? And he does it again, painful interval. Bass goes up, resolving to B. He's leading us to F sharp minor. And now, in the key of F sharp minor, which we were just in here, we were in F sharp minor, he gives us another Neapolitan chord, this cool G sharp major chord, which is just one half step above, of course, the F sharp minor, which we just had. So we have F sharp minor, and now G Neapolitan diminished. we get a nice little cadence, sus4 chord, dominant of F sharp minor. F sharp minor is of course our subdominant chord in the key of C sharp minor. So our whole our piece um, begins and ends in the world of C sharp minor, but here in the middle we modulate to F sharp minor, which is a fairly close, closely related key because it's only a fifth away from C sharp. If we have C sharp, if we go down a fifth, we go to F sharp, or if we go up a fourth, we go to F sharp. So this is what's known as the subdominant chord, or in this case, the subdominant key, because it's built on the note a perfect fourth above our tonic note. So here we are in F sharp minor. Again, this sort of quasi melody up here on the top. But this time, rather than going to this chord, like we would expect, we get a sort of a turn to this chord, right? It's a G sharp dominant seventh leading to C sharp minor. So we're back in our world of C sharp minor again. And then diminished chord going to the dominant. And then listen to this melody on the top, this the way he this is just a normal major chord, but then moving that top note up a half step, step gives us this crazy amount of tension, which re releases here in the next chord. Listen one more time. Going up and back down. Same thing here. It's all a C sharp minor chord, but he's leaping up to that E, which gives us a just a little bit of tension. And now comes this crazy middle section. This is really wild here. Beethoven uses this chain of diminished seventh chords, um, interspersed with some other chords in between sometimes, but it gives this next section a real feeling of being, being completely lost and wandering and kind of aimless. And what are we doing harmonically? It's, it's all very confusing. Let's listen. So first we get this diminished seventh chord. He keeps the bass the same all, all the way, by the way, here. The G sharp in the bass, now a C sharp minor chord. Another new diminished chord. And another one. And coming back down. And then emerges this melody out of all of that on the bottom. 
hear this melody. The bass is still on that G sharp. This is what we call a pedal tone because on the organ you have those notes in the pedals that you can press and hold down. So when a composer stays on one note and just keeps it there in the bass, that's known as a pedal note um, or sometimes pedal point. A major chord, half diminished chord, and our dominant of C sharp minor. So, and then we're back in our world of C sharp minor again. Like, just like at the beginning of the piece, this is what we might call the recapitulation in a sort of a loose sense, the part where the beginning of the piece comes back again in a sonata form, we call that the recapitulation. This is like the beginning. And now we're in the world of E major. But last time, remember, he switched to E minor. This time he doesn't do that. This time he keeps it in E major for a little longer with the dominant of E major. And we're going back to E again. And then this movement to the dominant of C sharp minor. So back to our original key, that wonderful Neapolitan chord again, and our dominant. And again, we get the switch to major, followed immediately by that painful interval again, that minor ninth back again. So on that minor ninth, you really want to emphasize that and going back down again to our F sharp minor chord and our dominant chord, our B7, which is the dominant of E major. So there's a lot of E major in this piece. That's because, of course, it's the uh, relative major of C sharp minor. Now we get a final beautiful cadence in C sharp minor. Back to this feeling of resignation. And now that quasi melody thing again comes in the bass. This is like fate knocking on the door here. That G sharp in the bass. And a little bit of those arpeggios from the middle section coming back again. interesting harmonic things going on there. And if that sounds too complicated for you, um, as I mentioned, check out petersonpianoacademy.com. That will take you more step by step through all the different harmonies and chords you need to learn one step at a time so that everything is nice and clear. I hope you've gotten a little sense of how crazy and really cool this piece of Beethoven's is, the Moonlight Sonata. And um, I hope to see you in the next video. Happy practicing!